Hi, welcome. If you haven't already, please like, subscribe, and turn on the notifications. And today we're interviewing the spare parts manager at Fada Automation and a jam creator named Joy Graydon. How are you doing today? I am doing just fine today, Max. Thank you. You're welcome. What is your work schedule like? I have your basic nine to five work schedule. Actually, it's eight to five and we get an hours with for lunch. Five when days did, a week. When did you start working at FADA Automation? I started working at FADA in March of 2022. What is the easiest thing about your job? Mm -hmm. The easiest thing about my job is really being a decision maker, knowing with the experience I have in the industry and with conveyors, what the right thing is to do at the right time and then making that decision. What is the hardest thing about your job? The hardest thing is um, sometimes figuring out what the right thing is is the the digging for a, a lot of it has to do with digging into old projects and drawings and knowing that i've got the right part for the equipment that our customer is trying to fix what is your favorite thing about your job i love conveyors so this job allows me to use all of my knowledge about conveyors and really make sure that uh and, and that's what i get to play in like i get to be the person that people depend on to get the right parts to fix their conveyors and i love knowing that information have you been to any of the places where you fixed the conveyors i have i've you... been to um the mercedes plants down south in a general assembly plant, which is really fun because that's where all of the pieces come on to the body. The dashboard, the tires, the engine, the transmission, everything comes together in general assembly. But most of my experience has been in paint shops and I've been in um, Toledo where they make the Jeep. So Stellantis' Jeep is made in Toledo. I've been in Windsor where they make the minivan. I've been to uh, Jefferson North here in downtown Detroit and was the documentation creator for Mac Avenue, which is Stellantis's new plant downtown. So I did all of the conveyor maintenance documentation for that plant and Warren Truck and Sterling Heights. So I've been to a lot of plants. Do you have a favorite plant? Um, I really liked the Mercedes plant only because, and it's selfish because it wasn't paint. Paint can be um, kind of boring because you're just taking basic steel bodies and washing them and rust proofing them and then painting them. So you never get to see the car all back together, but the Mercedes plant, um, which is a general assembly plant, I saw everything connecting to the body and the frame and everything else. So that was my favorite. What is your least favorite part about your job? Um, finding out that I've made a mistake. That's just, it's really hard because I try uh, to make sure I've done my research ahead of time. And then I can two or three months down the road realize I've made a mistake. For example, um, I had an order early, early this year, just when I had started the job, and the customer was asking for 75 steel rollers and 25 plastic rollers. When I put the order in our computer system, I transposed them, and I ordered him 75 plastic wheels and 25 steel. And I didn't find out about it until they arrived on our shop floor, and then I was like, so that's really hard. Oops. Yep, it was a big oops. Do you enjoy the learning curve you get from when you fail? Uh, I do because it's those kind of mistakes that help me see what it is I've got to be conscious of. Like, I don't just, I can't just be shuffling paper because, hey, I got five orders and I'm just gonna get them done really fast. I really have to stop. I have to slow down 
I have to look at what it is they need and I have to process it correctly. So I do enjoy, I mean, I appreciate the learning curve. I don't enjoy it when it comes from a big mistake. It's not, it's not fun, but I don't shy away from it. Do you ever have anxiety while or before you're making decisions? Mm, not a lot. I, I have all the anxiety before I make a decision. I do all the deep thinking before I push send or before I click go. So at the point of making a decision, I don't feel anxious because I believe that I've done the work I needed to do to get there. How do you deal with your anxiety when you have it? I um, actually do have a way around, not around my anxiety, but first of all, I recognize it. I recognize the physical feelings of anxiety. For me, it's an elevated heart rate. Like I can just be sitting calmly doing something and then I can feel my heart rate increase. And I can feel like a heat around my face or behind my ears or, or at the nap of my neck. I'm like, okay, I'm feeling a little anxious about this. And I will step away from my desk. I'll walk around, I'll go outside, and I definitely use um, breathing techniques. So I try to slow my breathing down and then think about what is it that I'm anxious about. What are the different breathing techniques that you use? Um, a lot of them come out of my yoga practice. So a, a, if I count my breath, so an in-breath, I would count to four, and an out-breath, I would count to five. So I would extend my out-breath so that I can calm my nervous system down. I think that's the one I use most at work. If I'm in my yoga practice, I would do other things, other breath techniques, but I wouldn't use them necessarily for anxiety. That's my go-to. How often do you do yoga? I do yoga um, at least two days a week. I'm trying to add an extra day, but in the summertime, I find that's really hard because I'm active. I'm having fun. I have a lot of plans and people to see, so I don't, um, I, it's really hard to get that third day in. Where do you do your yoga at? I actually found a yoga teacher, it was 50, about nine years ago, and she doesn't have a studio. She's just a teacher that had rented space to teach in, and I've been with her for nine years. And there's a small community of women who also were already either already connected with Melissa or came to connect with her after I found her. And now Melissa doesn't advertise anymore. We're just a small yoga community and she's our teacher. So we still contribute to the fees for rentals and to keep her as our instructor. But if I travel, Whenever I travel, wherever I go, I find a yoga studio and I take class with somebody I don't know in a place that I'm not familiar with. Do you have a favorite stretch when you're doing yoga? Yeah, I do. Um, I think it would be a butterfly pose where you're on your back and your feet are together and your knees are wide. And sometimes I'll do that pose with a block under my thighs or under my knees so I don't feel too much of a strain. But I love the way my spine feels on a flat surface where it just kind of relaxes. You know, sitting is, is all, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very forced position. But when you're laying down and your spine has the freedom to relax, that's probably my favorite resting position. What is I love your that question. <laughs> Thank you. What is your advice on how to deal with anxiety? Hmm. You know, I do actually think about this a lot, Max, because I have adult children who are very anxious. Um, I have some friends who are very anxious. Uh, and it's hard because when someone is anxious, 
it's very hard to to give them some words of advice you know the last thing you want to say to somebody who's anxious is oh you'll get through it oh it's nothing because to them it is something and it's not something that they're really ready to get through so i think probably my biggest advice would be just take a deep breath just stop for a minute don't make a decision don't worry yourself into something more than anxiety you know because i don't i don't know if you're familiar with anxiety that would lead to like that panic feeling or that panic attack you know just really stop take a deep breath think about is it really that bad or maybe it's not quite that bad and you can get through it what do you do as the spare parts manager oh i um i do a, quite a lot of stuff uh when a customer order comes through for parts i get it it is my responsibility and no one else's to process that order i have to determine what that part is where we get it from I have to create in our software an order in our system for that customer's or purchase order. And then I have to create a requisition to the purchasing department to say, I need you to buy this thing for my customer. So here's your copy, here's my copy. And then I track the delivery of that coming in. And when it has arrived, the software tells me I have a number of orders that are ready to ship. And then I create some other documentation, basically shipping documentation. And I go out to the shop and I say, hey guys, all of this stuff came in for the customer. Everything is here. I validated it. I printed out all the paperwork. Now I need you to go ahead and ship it. And then they take care of the shipping and bring me back the confirmation of shipping. And then I invoice the customer. What is it like to be the spare parts manager? Max? I love this job. I This is exactly the job I want. This is my last job. I will retire from this job. I, I just love it. I love, like, it's never, I'm not just selling widgets. You know, I, we don't have a catalog of parts. Every order is some new discovery. You know, there's some things that like, oh yeah, rollers, 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 but there are some plants out there that are just really trying to find someone that can help them get the right thing. And I get to do that research. I get to go through the engineered drawings. I get to find vendors who can make things out of steel or out of uh, um, a heavy plastic, either usually a machined piece that's going to help my customer out and I, I just love it I love digging into drawings I love the investigation part of it and then fulfilling the order and I do a lot of quoting too so the other part of everybody always having orders like I have, here's an order fulfill the order here's an order fulfill the order probably 40 percent of my day is spent quoting people on stuff that they can't find so I get to go look for it and and tell them how long it'll take to get it and how much it'll cost What's your favorite discovery about your job or what's your favorite part of what you've discovered so far? Huh. Or, I let think, me put that well, in more simple terms. What's your favorite thing you've discovered? Mm, I'm still working on one. I had a customer had placed an order um, last year in 2022 before I became the spare parts manager. And then in January, he called up and said, hey, I'm looking for my part. I'm like, I can't even find your order. So they resent me the order and <clears throat> it was a small part. You know, if you've got this big drawing, like there's all of these things that are drawn on one engineering drawing and there's one little thing over here in the corner. It was a little coupling and it had a reference to a supplier and I reached out to that supplier. They said, we don't make that anymore. And then I went, I probably have asked four or five other vendor manufacturers to help me come up with something that will meet this customer's needs. 
So the process of it, it, it was never an easy answer. I had to engage with engineering. I had to get engaged with our vendor base. I had to engage with the original supplier. And now I'm engaged with a machine shop that's actually modifying. I bought something, they're modifying it. And then um, making, machining another little plastic sleeve that goes with it. I just sent a box out to the customer and I said, I don't know if this is gonna meet your needs, but I want you to see it and I want you to test it before I send the order out to you. But I've been working on this for seven months. Hopefully it goes well. I, yeah, I didn't hear back from him last week and I didn't hear back from him today. So I'm hoping that it's all good news. Let's hope it works. Mm -hmm. Who is problem. your favorite person to work with? Ooh. There is um, a young man that was hired as the documentation person. So I originally hired into FADA as the um, maintenance and documentation writer, a technical writer, because that's also been my history in this industry. And when, uh, but we needed a second person. So they hired a young man by the name of Justin Vaught. And he is my favorite person to work with. He is, um, he has a degree in teaching with a master's in technology. So he really gets technology and I can have these great conversations about what technology should do for us in, in industry, in the workplace. Um, he's a great learner. Like I've taught him everything I know about conveyors and he just picks it up and he's very, uh, he's just the right kind of person for me to work very closely with. And I'm thrilled. I told him he can't leave until after I retire because he's part of my exit strategy. Like I just want a Justin in my work life because I really, really respect and enjoy the work that he does so much. What are you working on right now? Um, right now I'm working on software cleanup. So we have a software system that I am running all the customer orders through and I'm, I've learned to use the software correctly, but the person before me didn't use the software correctly. So there's a lot of loose ends and um, like problem orders and things that just need to be cleaned up. So the project I have right now is a uh, old job order cleanup that I'm working on. And then I have two questions from customers that I need answers from engineering. And I have a date with engineering. What is your career history and roles? Dude, you don't have time for that one. Uh, I, uh, I have had 42 jobs in my life. Most of them I had before I was 45. No, probably 55. But I have had so many different jobs. I've worked in so many diff different industries. I've landscaped. I've done small engine repair. I've done accounting. Um, I've worked in microfilm and microfiche. I've worked in the paper industry, which I really liked. I enjoyed that. Um, I've worked in printing. I've run a print shop. Uh, I've been a contractor. I support quality systems. I'm a fully accredited quality manager. So like for ISO quality systems, which is a quality standard that companies have to um, adhere to. Uh, and at the time when I was a contractor and I had a number of clients, one of those clients was a conveyor company and they asked me to come on board full time. So that was Central Conveyor and I worked for them for the last 15 years and now I'm at FADA to work out the rest of my conveyor career. What is your education? Um, I graduated from high school, pretty smart kid, went to Michigan State and got really dumb really fast. Um, I dropped out of college and I've been working ever since. Um, now I understand you make jam from your garden. It tastes really good. What inspired you to make your own jam? 
It was actually my husband. Um, his family made jam. My family never made jam. My grandmother didn't make jam. My mother, my aunts, my uncles, nobody in my um, life growing up made jam. I just thought Smuckers made jam. Um, and I met my husband and his family jammed. Like that was something that they did. And we actually, now it's not, it's not stealing peaches if there's a tree in front of a credit union and the fruit is falling off the tree onto the ground and rotting. And on a weekend when nobody's at work, we go and pick a few buckets of peaches and turn them into jam. So the first thing we ever made was peach jam from a credit union tree on Grand River in Farmington. And Is we there made turmeric in there, by the way. <laughs> no clove. Oh. Yeah, it's the clove flavor that you're tasting. But then as um as Doug and I started to grow our family, we have three um currently grown daughters. They're not going back to being ungrown. So we have three grown daughters. Um there was a lot of gifting. There was a lot of um uh, What's the word? Expectation of gifts and gifts given and gifts received. And I found that really difficult because we didn't have a lot of money. So I told Doug, I said, we're going to jam and then we're going to give to all of our family jams and jellies. And we're going to say to them out loud, we're not buying gifts. We're not going to buy gifts for you. You don't have to buy gifts for us. We have everything we need but we are going to make this jam and you are going to get this jam every year as long as we are still both on this earth. Um, and that's really what started it. And then the girls started going to school, to public school, and every Christmas they brought jams into all their teachers. And then it was the people that we work with where we share jam with the people we work with. Now my mom and my dad, and all of my in-laws all live out of state, so we don't see them at the holidays. And I send out a big stack of boxes out to the post office and send everyone in my family jams. So I make, last year I think I made 320 jars of jam, seven or eight different varieties. And at the end of the holiday season, we had 24 left. How long does it take to make your jams? It's really a process. We're in the middle of it right now. Um, we grow our own. We have two cherry trees. One is a sweet cherry tree that we snack on, and one is a tart cherry tree. So we uh, harvest all the cherries off our tart cherry tree. At the same time, the currants are all coming ripe on the east side of the house because we make a currant jelly. At the same time, the red raspberries are coming in as well. So there's a lot of work in harvesting because we harvest and freeze all of our fruit. And then in a cooler month like October or November, uh, we do all the jamming. And the jamming can take, if I could work at it solidly without a break, so no work, like I have the time off, I've got all the time I need, I can probably do it in seven or eight days. But because I have to maintain a work schedule now, uh, it takes me a month of doing stuff after work and really filling up weekends with nothing but jamming. So what's the cook time to make one jam? That's interesting. Well, I use a pectin, which is, um, which is a, a, actually it's a natural product that fruit uh, makes on its own, but if I increase the pectin, I can get it to jelly or jam faster. So it is 40 minutes from starting a batch to having all the jars sealed. But if I'm going to make seven batches of strawberry jam, then that's like 500 minutes. And that's when it gets to be long. That's when it's just, it's a lot of this. I'm just stirring and stirring and stirring and stirring and stirring. Have you thought about selling your jam in a store? Nope, never. It is, I, I do it absolutely exclusively to give away. What are the different jams and jellies? 
that you make? I make um, fresh Michigan strawberry jam, and I get all of my strawberries from the farmer's market in Farmington Hills. Um, so they're coming right out of Michigan soil. I prep three flats, so that's eight, it's 24 quarts of strawberries. Clean them, hull them, chop them, and put them in the freezer for strawberry jam because it is the best strawberry jam ever. It's red and it's just perfect. Uh, next up would be blackberry jelly. So do you know the difference between jam and jelly? I do not. There's a big difference. Jams actually are made with the full fruit, the juice and the pulp of the fruit, where a jelly is made simply from the juice. You're gonna throw out all the skin, seeds, pulp, anything, any solids that come from the fruit. So Doug and I grow blackberries. Uh, it's a thornless variety of blackberry, which makes it really easy to pick. It's not painful. Um, and we have plants that have been established for over 20 years and they produce so much fruit. We can pick 15 to 30 gallons of blackberries off of our blackberry plants. Now, I don't, I don't like a year where we get 30 because it's just, it's more than we can process. So we have started, because the plants are so healthy, we've started having people come over and pick off the plants during the height of the season. The blackberries right now are probably going to be ripe in two weeks. So maybe three, but right around the end of July, we'll start picking blackberries. And then we'll make blackberry jelly, which is just from the juice. It's absolutely amazing. So sticking with jellies, we make red raspberry jelly. We grow our own red raspberries in a little secret spot right behind the blackberries. And they're in season right now. So I've already harvested a full gallon and I'll probably get two more off the plants because they're just, they're so heavy, heavy laden with fruit. So jellies, the next one would be currant jelly. Currant is an, more of an old fruit. It is very, very tiny. The, the, the actual fruit is about the tip of your pinky. So it's a very small pearl, small round fruit. It has very little juice. You need a large volume of currants to make a batch or two of currant jelly. So it's always a micro batch or a smaller batch for me. Um, Doug's been tending currant plants probably for about seven years now. And he does all the currant picking because I don't like the currant plants. They're hard to pick, they're really finicky. So he does all the currants. I'll make the jelly, but I don't pick the currants. So let's see, there's jelly, jelly, jelly. Oh, so there's a, a fruit that is native to Michigan. It's called a black raspberry so it's the it's the small berry that you'd see if you were out camping or if you're out in the wilderness somewhere going for a hike it's a dark dark berry um, I've made jelly from those as well but it takes about two years to to find enough fruit because it is a wild fruit it's not a um, it's not nursery stock so that one is a little rare and everybody loves it. When it's available, uh, I usually make it in a smaller jar so that more people can have a taste of it. It was with strawberry, blackberry, all the jellies. So now to jam. So cherry jam, cherry jam is always made with a tart cherry because that's what gives it that like really that good cherry pie flavor almost. So it's a little bit tart, the sugar sweetens it up in it in the process, but probably cherry jam is my favorite. And this year it will all be off of our tree. Um, we don't always get that kind of production off our cherry tree. If I don't, I buy from a local farmer um, who grows all his fruit in uh, Coloma, Michigan, on the west, the west side of the state on Lake Michigan. So if I, if I purchase fruit, I purchase it harvested from Michigan. All my strawberries, all my cherries. And the last one is peaches. Um, so 30 years ago, when we made our first batch of peach jam, remember we kind of picked up the fruit off of a 
credit union peach tree that nobody was paying attention to. Uh, since then, we've tried to grow peaches, but we can't really get a good tree. We've got a peach tree in the back right now. It has not produced fruit, and it's probably been back there five years already. So I don't think we'll ever be able to grow our own. So I go back to the farmer's market, uh, and I wait for peaches to be freestone. So a peach starts out at the beginning of the season, the variety of peach that you can buy ripe in Michigan is a, it's called cling. And the fruit of the peach clings to the, the seed, to the, the nut on the inside. Well, if you wait one or two or three weeks, the peaches will come in freestone where you can cut them off of the pit and they, the fruit won't stick to it. So I wait until the peaches are freestone and then I buy a full bushel of fresh Michigan peaches and I take them home and process them. That one's, that's a lot of processing because I actually have to blanch them, peel off the skin, cut them off of the seed and then freeze them all. But I freeze everything. I do not, there's no um, harvest to jamming for me. I harvest everything everything gets frozen, and then I can slowly take stuff out of the freezer as I can make time to do the jamming. What's your favorite jams and jellies to make? Ooh, to make. Um, the first 10 batches are my favorite. The next 30 are a little bit rougher. So whatever I make first is my favorite because I'm like back in it again and I'm enjoying it. But when the end of the week comes along, I'm, it's, I'm struggling. It's a lot, a lot of work. But then as soon as I give the first jar away, I'm okay. So the first time I hand somebody a jar and they go, oh, I've been waiting all year for this, then, then it's worthwhile. So you don't have a favorite? My favorite, my personal favorite is cherry. I love, love, love cherry jam. And I've never tasted anything, anybody else's cherry jam that was as good as my cherry jam. Now are the recipes a secret? No, I use, um, I follow the ball uh, canning recipes. It's just a proportion of fruit to sugar and pectin, which is interesting. Two years ago, the ball recipes reduced the sugar. Like there's always been a no sugar substitute, but I mean, I'm, I'm making jam. It's fruit and sugar mixed together until it's solid and you can spread it. I mean, that's, that's the root of all jams and jellies, but ball reduced their sugar and it still sets perfectly well so i can actually make a i can make more jam with a little less sugar which i appreciate but no nothing's a secret anybody could do this so max if you're not busy in october you can come to my house and we'll jam together and whatever you jam with me is what you get to take home i love cooking and baking it's a lot okay. of fun okay well this might be an adventure I've had very, I've had probably, I bet you I've had 20 or 30 people in my kitchen jamming. Like people are like, well, I've never done it. I just like to try and I'm like, come on over. I'll put you to work. It's, just leave a comment in the description and I will forward anything to you. Okay. That would be fine. Let's go out to the garden. Part one, this is the cherry trees. So right here, this is our original cherry tree. This is a tart cherry. There's our ladder. We have to put that up on the tree to be able to get all those cherries. We have already picked 10 quarts of cherries on the tree, which is enough we need for jamming. So we probably won't be, we won't be taking off any more off the tree. They'll be for the, the birds. This tree, this beauty here is a sweet cherry tree and we grow this tree just for snacking. Next is the berries, the blackberries and the red raspberries. 
So this is on the side of our house, like on the side of the garage. You can see how absolutely packed these plants are. These are the black blackberries and they won't be ripe for a few more weeks. But when they are, they'll be about the size of the first knuckle of your thumb and dark, dark, dark blue, almost black. And we will be picking them for probably three or four weeks. Now this garden has an arch, which we can go through. And on the other side of this arch is the red raspberries. And you know, I should have taken this before I picked, but I just picked a quart of red raspberries off of these plants. These are the left, the rest that are left on the plant. So we'll be harvesting these for another two weeks as well. So. The red raspberries will be finishing up as the black res as the blackberries are starting. So these are all of the red raspberries. And then you turn around and here's the other side of the blackberries. So it's not it's not a lot of space, but we do a great job of growing in this tiny little space that we live in. Okay, the last fruit that we grow for production is currants. And I told you this is an old plant. So these are on the east side of the house. I'm gonna slip through the gate here because we have terrible problems with deers. And these are the currants. They grow all the way along the house on this side. There are black and blush and red currants. And they go all the way to the end here. And I can come down here. I'm going to give you a close up of what a current looks like. That is the fruit of a current plant. It's very small. Here is my finger for comparison. So that's about how big they are. And this is all that we grow. And I would like to thank you for joining. I've had a lot of fun. And I will let you know sometime when I'm not super busy. Uh-huh. In the I, fall, 